Energy is one of those things in science that can be hard to wrap your head around. Energy is the capacity to do work or make something happen. There are two main categories for the different forms of energy, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy describes a situation where work isn't currently being done, but it could be done under the right situation. There's gravitational potential energy, which relies on the position and has the potential to fall down. There's chemical energy, which is the energy that's stored in bonds of atoms. There's nuclear energy, which is the energy stored in the nucleus of an atom, which keeps it together, and stored mechanical energy that is created with pressure, like a taut spring or a stretched rubber band. Kinetic energy is the form of action. Radiant energy is electromagnetic energy, like the sun's rays. Thermal energy is the internal energy of a substance, which we can't actually measure, but we can calculate energy when the thermal energy moves, and movement is what we call heat. Motion is the energy of movement, Sound is the energy of compression waves, and electrical energy is the movement of electrons. In this lesson, we're going to focus a little on chemical energy and largely on the thermal energy and its transfer process, heat. When we talk about heat, we have to specify two things. Our system, which is the item we're focusing on, and the surroundings with a defined limit. I chose a cat because I heard the internet likes them. This cat is alive and metabolizing the food it ate, and it's giving off heat, which goes from the system to the surroundings. To denote heat, we use the letter Q. I don't really know why, but that's what it is. The cat is giving away its heat, or losing its heat, so we say that the Q is negative. The Q of the surroundings is absorbing the heat that the cat is releasing, or gaining heat, so it stays positive. The amount of heat released by the cat will be equal to the amount of heat absorbed by the surroundings. This fact will become useful soon. Now, the heat lost or gained could be the other way around, like this. The surroundings give off heat. So imagine this. An ice cube is starting to melt. The ice cube is the system, and the surroundings would include the air and the surface that the ice cube's on. This time, heat is leaving the surroundings and moving into the ice cube, which causes it to melt. Notice it's not cold that moves, it's always, always heat that moves. The Q of the system in this case is positive, and the Q of the surroundings is negative. Now it's important to note that heat and temperature are not actually the same thing, even though we may use the words interchangeably in everyday conversation. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy, whereas temperature is the average kinetic energy of particles. You can't directly measure heat. We don't have heatometers. It's just too complicated to calculate every possible source of heat energy in an object, kind of like trying to precisely measure the volume of the ocean. It's just not going to happen. But we can measure temperature with thermometers. The main unit of measurement for heat is joules, and the unit for temperature is Celsius or Kelvin. You can use either one because when we measure heat, we tend to measure the change in temperature. The only thing they have in common is that you can use temperature as part of a calculation to find heat. Let's look at temperature with a little more depth to make sure we really understand. We'll start by viewing a scale that measures the relative number of particles at different speeds. Particles are always moving unless they're at absolute zero. These few particles with a slower speed have less kinetic energy than these particles that have faster speeds and high kinetic energy. But we can't easily take a snapshot of just one or a few particles. When we measure the temperature, we're looking at the average kinetic energy of many particles. This curve may represent a fairly warm temperature, and this curve a relatively lower one. There are lots of particles that have the same kinetic energy at both temperatures, but again, temperature is the average kinetic energy of all the particles. So how do we use temperature to find heat? Imagine you have a flame and you hold a steel coffee percolator above the flame. Heat will move from the flame to the percolator, which will increase the speed of the particles, also known as temperature. So as heat increases, temperature increases. This is a direct relationship. If heat is represented by Q and the temperature change is delta T, then when we write our equation, Q and delta T will be on opposite sides of the equal sign. But there's something else that matters about the percolator. What if we had a much bigger percolator? Would the same amount of heat change the temperature the same amount as the small percolator? Because there are more particles that have to get moving faster, it will require more heat to change the temperature the same amount. This means heat and mass are directly related as well. So mass, or m, needs to go on the opposite side of heat. All we have left to consider next is the constant. The object we are monitoring will have a different constant depending on what it's made of. If we're heating up a copper tub, or water, or some other chemical, we would have a different constant. 
So we use the specific heat capacity, or C, to represent the amount of heat the substance requires to raise 1 gram, 1 degree Celsius. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And iron is 0.46 joules per gram degree Celsius. This means that water can absorb a lot more heat before the temperature changes, and iron changes temperature easily when the heat changes. So now we have our equation, Q equals MC delta T, or sometimes I call it Q equals M cat, which is going to be an incredibly handy equation. Let's see a situation where we would use it. Aluminum has a specific heat capacity of 0.902 joules per gram degree Celsius. How much energy is released when one kilogram of aluminum cools from 35 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius? We're going to use Q equals MC delta T. The delta T really means the final temperature minus the initial temperature, so we can substitute that information in to the equation. The mass is 1000 grams, the specific heat is 0.902 joules per gram degree Celsius, the final temperature was 20, so it's 20 minus 35, which will give us a negative number, and that negative is significant. Grams cancel, Celsius cancels, our final answer is negative 13,500 joules. The negative number means that heat is being released. This is exothermic, and that is consistent with what the problem stated earlier. Calorimetry is the science of measuring heat transfer, and in order to do that, you're going to need a calorimeter. This is a calorimeter. It can be made of really expensive materials and be incredibly efficient at insulation. Or it can be made out of styrofoam cups and do a darn good job of insulation as well. All you need to do this at home is two stacked styrofoam cups, a thermometer, a lid, a stirrer, and a known amount of water. Let's say you have all this ready to go, and you've read the initial temperature of water. Then you take a hot piece of copper at 90 degrees and drop it into the calorimeter. As you stir, you'll see the temperature rise. Eventually, it will stop rising when it's at equilibrium, meaning the water and the copper metal are the same temperature. The heat given off by the metal is absorbed by the surroundings, which includes the water, stirrer, cup, and even the thermometer itself. The majority of the heat will be transferred to the water, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll do calculations assuming that all the heat is actually transferred to the water. But here, I'm being honest. Let's try a calculation to figure out heat transfer with the simple version. An unknown piece of metal weighing 50 grams at 90 degrees Celsius is dropped into a calorimeter that contains 200 grams of 25 degree water. The final temperature of the water is 28.3 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat capacity of the metal? First, we'll calculate the amount of heat absorbed by the water because we have all the information we need. 200 grams of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the final minus initial temperature. Grams cancel, Celsius cancels, and our answer is 2,760 joules for the water. Because the water could only absorb heat that was released by the metal, we can assume the same amount of heat was released as was absorbed. So now we can solve for the specific heat capacity of the unknown metal. So here's our equation, but we want to solve for specific heat capacity. To isolate it, we'll need to divide both sides by m and delta t. The mass canceled, delta t canceled, and here's our cleaned up equation. Now we plug in the data and calculate, and we get 0.9 joules per gram degree Celsius, which is the specific heat capacity of aluminum. So that was probably a piece of aluminum that was dropped in the calorimeter. The last thing we're going to look at are phase changes and chemical reactions. In this diagram, we have the temperature of water in degrees Celsius on the side and energy added in kilojoules on the bottom. The graph starts by showing ice at a temperature below freezing. As we add heat, the temperature goes up until we get to zero. At zero, even though heat is being added, the temperature isn't changing. This is because the heat is going into changing the phase of water from a solid to a liquid, not into increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. The amount of energy required to either melt or freeze water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. This is known as the delta H, or enthalpy of fusion. Enthalpy is just heat at a constant pressure. Once all the ice is melted, the heat will raise the temperature of the water until it hits 100 degrees Celsius. This is the boiling point, or vaporization point, of water. Now it will take 40.7 kilojoules per mole of energy to turn the liquid into a vapor. This is the delta H of vaporization. After all the water becomes a vapor, the increased heat will continue to increase the temperature of the vapor. This is also why steam burns are worse than hot water burns. They have a much higher temperature. So how can you calculate all the energy required to go from ice to steam? It just takes a few more steps. 
Let's try this problem. Calculate the amount of heat necessary to vaporize 125 grams of ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So we'll need all of this information. Q equals MCAT, the specific heat of water and ice, and the enthalpy of vaporization and fusion of water. Now let's break down the process. First, we'll calculate the energy needed to warm up the ice to zero degrees Celsius. Since the temperature is changing as we add heat, we'll use Q equals MC delta T. We'll also need the specific heat capacity of ice, which is 2.1 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now we plug in our data. We have the mass of 125 grams, the specific heat, and the final temperature, which was zero, minus the initial temperature of negative 10. Be careful with those double negatives. This creates a positive number. So our Q will be 2,625 joules. We'll save rounding the sig figs until the end. The next step in the diagram is the melting of the ice. Melting ice doesn't change the temperature at all, so we can't use Q equals MCAT. Instead, we'll use the enthalpy of fusion and dimensional analysis. We'll start with the 125 grams of water, we'll multiply by the molar mass of water, and then multiply that by the molar heat of fusion, which gets rid of our grams and moles and leaves us just with kilojoules. So our answer is 41.7 kilojoules, or 41,700 joules. Heating water involves a change in temperature. So this time we'll use Q equals MCAT and the specific heat of liquid water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We'll plug in the mass, the specific heat, and the final temperature, which is 100 minus the initial, in this case, zero, and we'll get 52,300 joules. Finally, we calculate the heat of vaporizing the water with the enthalpy of vaporization and dimensional analysis. Start with 125 grams, we'll multiply by the molar mass of water and the enthalpy of vaporization, and we get 283 kilojoules or 283,000 joules. Lastly, you add the values from each step, and you get 380,000 joules or 380 kilojoules. But what does a number like this even mean? Let's put it in terms of something we're more familiar with. Let's talk about calories. There are 4.184 joules for every one calorie. Is that number familiar? It should be. It's the specific heat of water, which makes it nice and easy to remember. But calories with a lowercase c aren't the calories that you see on the back of a food carton. Those are kilocalories, or calories with a capital C. So let's use some dimensional analysis to see how many kilocalories it would take to turn 125 grams of ice into vapor. We start with 380,000 joules, and we'll convert from joules to calories, and then we'll convert from little calories to big calories, which are kilocalories, and we get 91 calories. That's like a quarter cup of guacamole. Mmm, guacamole. Uh, one last thing before I go make some guacamole, let's calculate the heat of reaction of a chemical. The process is really just like calorimetry, but instead of putting some object in water, you'll mix two chemicals together in a calorimeter or dissolve some chemical in water. You measure the temperature to its highest or lowest point to get the final temperature. Let's try an example with the molar heat of dissolution. 0.333 moles of a solid was dissolved in 260 milliliters of water at 22.3 degrees Celsius. After the solid had fully dissolved, the final temperature of the solution was 27.5 degrees Celsius. What is the molar heat of solution of the substance? We start this problem just like the unknown metal calorimetry problem. We'll calculate the Q of water first because we have all of the information. Because one milliliter of water is equal to one gram, we can say that there are 260 grams of water. The specific heat of water is 4.184, and the final minus initial is 27.5 minus 22.3. So the heat is 5,700 joules. The water absorbed the heat, which means the reaction gave off heat, so we'll make the reaction itself a negative number. We want to know the heat of dissolution in joules per mole. So we have to divide the number of joules by the number of moles, and we get negative 17,000 joules per mole, or negative 17 kilojoules per mole. So this might be potassium chloride dissolved in water. I just looked that up. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe.